life we have a lot to do with them. I remember being taught way back at La Trappe in the early stages that we are in conspectu angelorum, we are in the sight of the angels and we are singing in that mode in conspectu angelorum psalam tibi deus meus, I will sing songs to you O God. And he reminded us that the wings carved on the choir stores a reminder of that. Indeed, St. Bernard is said to have seen angels going up and down around the brethren, and some had a lot to carry and others far less, depending on how, how much they were engaging. He also was given to understand that certain parts of the Divine Liturgy had to have total concentration. He was given to understand in particular moments like the Te Deum, which is a very angelic chant, ancient and still used, on feast days like this in the night. And actually, it's something which, when one sings in the night, brings us very close to that hidden realm. And I still keep the habit of bowing profoundly at the thrice holy mention of God that is in it there. The choirs of angels are mentioned, all the categories of saints are mentioned. The Son of God is glorified, and on it goes in perpetual praise on earth, echoing that perpetual praise of the angels in heaven, which is what we're doing in the monastic life. And the teaching of the Council of Fathers in the document on the liturgy is that the liturgy of the earth must be a counterpart of that of heaven. Now, do you see it, the implications thereby that nothing should be spared? 
and how unpleasing it is to angels to see shoddy liturgy, the cheap, the functional, the quick, and then worse still, the profane coming in. In recent times, we have creeping in more and more music which is recorded, and it's not authentic liturgy. It's something which was condemned in 1958 by Pope Pius XII in that decree on sacred music that it had to be authentic. And therefore, this creeping in bit by bit of staged liturgy, pressing a button and it happens, is false. And against all the present thinking of the Church with regard to what authenticity is about, that extends to even the likes of artificial flowers. It even extends actually to having flowers at all on the actual mensa of sacrifice. But there's a load of consequences to the notion of authenticity. But authenticity also is what the Lord himself asks for when he talks to the Samaritan woman. Worship in spirit and in truth. So the truth has to be there and the spirit. Therefore, all that we do on the external is an expression, an outworking of something deeper. And that something deeper, if it's not there, is going to lead to something not there on the outside as well. And people then will not easily feel the difference between what is authentic and what is not. And people don't seem to realise how offensive to the angels it is when much of the praise reverts to man. How many rounds of applause happen in church? Is God praised there, or the executor of beauty? Well, to return to this gospel, this is our hidden family, angels. We all have one. It seems that an angel, an extra one, a second one is given to a bishop. In a place where the best sacrament is, there is a dense cloud of angelic presence, and one feels it, especially alone at night. And therefore, when one is celebrating even alone without any other human being there, the angels are very much one's congregation, and they're truly there. And one can pause at the elevation, for instance, and let them praise. I remember being moved in France in the mid-80s when involved with the great renewal that was going on at the time in the charismatic renewal and there there would be at the elevation a spontaneous burst of angelic glossolalia singing in tongues and it just burst out and seemed to echo what were the angels doing around us it's all gratuitous praise and their time just didn't enter into it they went into a somewhat eastern mode of going on and on because time had ceased to exist clouds of incense, the body entering it fully, and so on. That was authentic, not piped, not human. So we need to be aware that the Spirit wants and is creating beauty by inspiring people, artists, musicians, singers, preachers. It's all a movement in which we're involved. And if it gives us inspirations to do things, e.g. creating a place of beauty or suggestions of beauty with images or statues, we're part of that. It's producing with our hands and our means something on earth which is glorifying God with what the angels normally don't do. However, they can do a bit. In fact, I remember being with you a few years ago when your children were a little smaller and I think I was on one of these feast days with you. It must have been the 2nd of October, the Holy Guardian Angels. Because I remember talking about angelic interventions. And afterwards, we were sitting in your conservatory area, and we were discussing things and trying to find one or two things on YouTube where there were actual angelic interventions caught. Because with closed-circuit television, that's happening more than before and there are things which have been caught and therefore are authentic. And I remember your, one of your daughters knew about one, she'd seen it already, when there's this man coming up towards a crossroads and doesn't know that he's coming towards a terrible accident if he carries on. 
is actually cycling and there's this huge heavy goods vehicle coming right at him and one sees on the slowed down version of the recorded event that at a certain point a beam of light comes in, removes him and his bike and puts it on the side and walks off into the nothingness of the night. That was angelic intervention. And also you may have had in your life events in a car or whatever where things are going towards what could be death and suddenly you feel that was a, a close escape but actually probably more. There was an angelic protection that didn't become a lethal accident. And they are glad when we invoke them. So it's a whole world to be much aware of. And also, since this is the day of the maximum, the three archangels, it's a time to be aware that we're involved as a Christian family, as a church, in something of that nature on a cosmic level. Now perhaps more than ever. And that Lucifer who was once the brightest of angels, remember, has not lost his power to do harm by now, nor his angelic intelligence. And so we're up against something which has power and mind greater than our own, and we need protection. We are in danger, not only as individuals, but as a race and as a church. Therefore, these are very much our brethren in the fight. Mark, in, normally St. Michael doesn't need to actually come, as it were, in the same way as the guardian angels, because these higher angels, their work is of a higher order. But having said that, St. Michael does have an awful lot to do with the earth, and has more than once intervened directly, and has been seen to do so even. Moreover, he's involved with souls. He's involved with death. And we know that at the moment of death, he's very much present and he accompanies souls after the separation of body and soul and is therefore present at the execution of the judgment. And he is not without reason portrayed with the scales. Actually, in the one here, he's got them and in yours, he's got them too. He's got these scales of justice and the soul might be there waiting, hoping for the best. So that moment is a moment of huge consequences. So if at the dying person's bedside, just see, open your eyes and be aware, all eternity is right now in the balance. The bad angels want their bit, their pound of flesh, and the good angels are trying their best. It's not the time to be talking about football. I conclude, St. Michael is also concerned with the Blessed Sacrament and he's portrayed quite often protecting it. That was a real icon made by a person who never married, who gave his life to the Lord. His name was Michael himself, and I buried him actually in the old rite in Northern Ireland, or close. And he, that person who wanted that kept, is in a sense reminding us by leaving that word in the icon that what we do is also under the gaze of the angels. And it's fitting that when we're at the altar, we exclude all earthly thought, all earthly modality. That's why it's horrific when one can actually even think about, at that point, executing beauty and wanting a round of applause. We ought rather to be rather like the Eastern Fathers, aware that the closer we come to majesty, the only fitting position is actually, as the angels were taught at Fatima, with the nose to the ground, in front of ultimate majesty and glory, before which, like Moses, we are invited to take off our sandals, for we are on holy ground. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, holy, 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 merciful, mighty, God in three persons, blessed and three.
Bless and three. 